Today we have something that's a little different insofar as we have what I call oligarchs, billionaires, people with huge quantities of money who are in a position to dramatically shape policymaking. Right now, the focus in policymaking has been war in Ukraine, open borders, and war in the Middle East. Why are we so committed at this stage to an offensive war that Israel wants to wage with virtually the entire region? Remember, this all began uh, ostensibly on the basis of the 7 October attack. Well, the 7 October attack has uh, been debunked in many respects in that all of the, not all, but most of the horrific atrocities associated with decapitating babies or baking babies in ovens and mass rapes and murders and so forth, many of that, many of those assertions have turned out to be false. We know that. Secondly, you know, I was in Israel in 2020 and I actually visited the headquarters that sat right outside of Gaza that was responsible for securing the area. Uh, I thought the security was airtight, and they had covered every conceivable base that you could. They knew who was doing something in Gaza almost before the individual inside Gaza knew he was doing it, to the point where uh, someone in Gaza took a shot at an Israeli soldier in one of the guard towers that overlooked this giant sort of uh, barbed, wired, fenced-in concentration camp, and they knew which person had actually fired the round. I mean, they, they, they had this thing nailed. Now, we also know that before this began, there was a group of Israel, Israeli women. These were women serving in the Israeli Defense Force who were given the responsibility to monitor everything that was happening inside Gaza. It was an intelligence sale. So, and you have to understand the Israelis are very smart in the way they utilize human capital. When you come into the Israeli Defense Force, they put you through a battery of tests and they determine where you can be most useful and helpful to the national defense. And then they assign you accordingly. So these women were picked up for their intelligence, their understanding, uh, their command of languages and so forth. And they reported that there were preparations obviously underway inside Gaza for a very long time, indicating that something really big was, was building. And they kept telling people and telling people and telling people, telling the chain of command, the people who were in charge. The answer was, well, thank you very much. We've got that covered. Nothing changed. Then you had the deputy chief of intelligence in Egypt, the Egyptian military, the day before the attack, who called to warn that this attack was imminent and described that it could be very dangerous. And he was thanked for his interest in Israel's national defense and nothing was done. And then you had this long delay before Israeli forces actually show up on the scene, and then they start killing everybody. And I'm, when I say everybody, I'm also talking about, unfortunately, a number of Israeli citizens, along with whatever else they could find that was moving out of the country into back into Gaza. The whole thing is very, very suspicious. And then suddenly, instead of uh, this vengeance campaign designed to permanently disabuse Hamas of the wisdom of ever trying something like this again, it becomes a scorched earth policy of mass murder and expulsion. In other words, we're, we're now going to wipe out Gaza. And after Gaza, we're going after the West Bank. And oh, by the way, we're going after Hezbollah. And then you have uh, weeks later, Netanyahu who's saying, well, now's the time for us to settle accounts with everybody. And we discover that he has the United States Armed Forces effectively under control of Israeli national military power. And that the American people haven't been consulted on any of this. They're simply saying, oh, yeah, sure, we should support Israel and help Israel defend itself. Yeah, but this has very little to do with defending Israel. This has a lot to do with militarily establishing Jewish supremacy in the Middle East. Do we really want to sign on for a war that pits Israel against everyone in the region? hundreds of millions of Muslims. How does this help us? That question never comes up. Instead, we deploy three carrier battle groups, uh, hundreds of aircraft, dozens of ships, submarines, uh, along with special operations forces and, and other elements of the Army and the Marine Corps. And then we wait, and we wait, and we wait until Netanyahu decides when and how he will attack Iran. 
and we hear that we are now part of this imminent attack on Iran. Now, this means a, a declared war. No, there's no declaration of war. There is no debate in Washington, no discussion. Gosh, isn't that a little odd? So why is this the case? Well, how much money is involved? Who's getting the money? Now, we already know that dozens and dozens and dozens of members of Congress show up and they may be worth 150 to four or 500,000, occasionally a million, and they all leave as multimillionaires. Where does all of this money come from? Who is bankrolling it? Who is pushing it? And, and that's what you've got to go back and look at the, not just the industries and the corporate groups, whether it's, you know, an organization like Raytheon or Lockheed Martin that obviously profits enormously when large numbers of missiles and rockets and so forth are, are utilized. That's one piece of it. Who else? Who wants this? And what is this thing called the American-Israeli Political Action Committee that has billion, billions of dollars ostensibly in its at its beck and call. And that's money is not coming from Israel. That comes from within the United States. That's why APAC, the Israeli lobby, as we call it, is not a foreign lobby. Its money originates inside the United States. Who is behind APAC? Who is contributing this money? And how does this money drive the United States into what looks like a regional war, beginning with a major attack on a foreign country without any debate, without any vote, without any discussion. Hmm. Why? We've got to go back to donor occupation. Who are the donors? Where's the money coming from? And how much money are we talking about that each congressman or a member of the Senate ultimately benefits from? And remember, there are various ways to benefit. Certainly, they'll put money into your uh, re-election campaign fund, whether it's the defense industry or the, or the Israel lobby or some other lobby. But there's also the benefit of aligning yourself with these lobbies. They can they can arrange for lucrative deals for you, especially after you leave office. If you retire from the military, they can give things to you, opportunities to you that you might otherwise never get. So it's a, it's a complex picture. It's a desperate situation that we're in right now. We don't have control over anything. But I can guarantee you that Mr. Netanyahu has infinitely more control over what happens with U.S. armed forces and American foreign policy than you or I or any group of American citizens. Because as I see it right now, they're on the path to fighting not only everybody in the region, including ultimately at some point the Turks, but then also the Russians. So what, what are we doing? And how does any of this serve our interest? How does this help us?